This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Roger sits down with Glenn Hubbard, the Dean Emeritus and a professor at Columbia Business School. From 2001 to 2003, he also served as the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Roger and Dr. Hubbard discuss his new book, The Wall and the Bridge, Fear and Opportunity in Disruption's Wake. Dr. Glenn Hubbard, welcome to Reaganism. It's my pleasure, thanks for having me. Well, you're the Dean Emeritus and a professor at Columbia Business School. Uh, And from 2001 to 2003, you were the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors during the Bush 43 administration, President George W. Bush. And you're here today because you are the author of a new book called The Wall and the Bridge, Fear and Opportunity in Disruption's Wake. We're going to talk about the book. Uh, I love the title. um, And it's got so many different layers to it, which I know uh, you'll, you'll share with us. But you're an economist at, at, at the heart, that's been the heart of your career. What got you interested in the world of economics? Well, it's a great question. You know, I, I got into uh, economics coming from engineering, which is what I studied as an undergrad. And I became interested in economics because I was looking for ways to improve the lives of people, of businesses, of economies. Uh, And I saw economists having an enormous role in that in the public policy process. The more I studied economics, the more excited I got because I saw that it was actually the actions of millions of individuals and firms that uh, made the economy great, not a top down. I I came to Hayek before Hayek came to me. I mean, I Mm. had that observation, but then obviously drilled in me by the work of great economists like Hayek or Milton Friedman. Uh, and Hayek, of course, was um, the economist, actually, President Reagan uh, uh, was, uh, I believe, interacted with him and certainly read his uh, his work, who advanced the uh, opportunities that, that a free market and capitalism uh, offers and, 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 and what it does for society. I mean, is that... That's right. And also the power of a market system. You know, people know Hayek mainly for the book, The Road to Serfdom. But I think mm-hmm. in economics, he's probably most influential for a paper on the use of knowledge, where he argues that in decentralized markets, prices send the signals that are far more valuable than any central planner might have. You know, the, the debate between markets and socialism is largely gone, except perhaps in a few university audiences. But the debate over the power of markets is one that is a constant teachable moment. And Hayek was the first to rigorously tee that up. Yeah, I want to go back. We'll get, uh, go to the discussion of markets uh, a little later in our conversation. But before we jump to the book, The Wall and the Bridge, your new book, I want you to hit on uh, perhaps one of the uh, concerns or issues that provoked this latest work. And that was an article you wrote in The Atlantic. And in that article, you outlined that your students uh, were had real doubts about capitalism, about uh, the goodness of a free market, and primarily was saying that whether or not it left people better off, and in their view, it was leaving them behind. And and perhaps that's not surprising for our viewers and listeners. But you teach at Columbia Business School. This is a place where uh, it, you would think people select because they recognize the opportunities and market offers. They recognize the um, the advantages of of capitalism. You know. If, you could imagine other departments in, in a university campus where somebody who was a doubter of capitalism might end up, but a business school, probably not. Tell me more about that experience and how it shaped uh, the work that we'll discuss in a moment. Well, it was, a, it's, uh, it was an interesting experience for me. I had been teaching um, more finance-oriented courses in the MBA program while I was dean. When I stepped out, I wanted to teach political economy, so I, I picked up that hat, and it was in that class that students had expressed skepticism. I originally heard it as skepticism about the market system as a whole, but it really is, as you pointed out, was more a skepticism about who gets what in capitalism. So I I tried to reason with them going back to the great economic classic, the Monty Python movie, Life of Brian. And I'm thinking of the scene where they asked, well, what did the Romans 
ever do for us? <laughs> and then they list the thousands of things the Romans did. And I said, that's what capitalism is. All those things around you. And I think I had an aha moment with them. Mm. But then they had one with me pushing back on the unevenness of the gains from capitalism. That is a serious issue. It is not necessarily capitalism's fault. There's much more that public policy can do, that business can do. But I expect that's a lot of the anxiety about capitalism. It's super important for the reason I mentioned in the Atlantic. If you're a business leader, don't take social support for the system for given. It's not. Social support for our wonderful market economy is just that, social support, which means we have to constantly re-engage the public with the power and the values of capitalism for their own life of Brian moment. <laughs> yeah, it's social support, I mean, that's a, that's a great way to put it. You, you constantly have to reinforce the infrastructure of our market and of our society to, to support uh, the values and principles uh, that underlie it. And, and in the absence of you doing that in the classrooms of Columbia Business School or professors across the country doing that in their lecture halls, people are looking at other models and, well, and they're that, certainly out there. Go ahead. That's true. But I, I think that's why it's important to talk to students and the public about what I would call an all-in economy. One way conservatives often talk about all-in is it should be an economy where I, Glenn Hubbard, or you, Roger Zackheim, can be all in, and that we can become an entrepreneur, a professional person, whatever it is we want. But another version of all in is that we're all in the economy. You know, classical enlightenment thinkers imagined what my colleague Ned Phelps, who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, calls mass flourish. And that ought to be our goal, an all in economy. If we have that in mind, then I think the power of markets and capitalism becomes all the more visceral for people. So by saying all in, I mean, it responds to the, the critique you heard from your students, which is that it was leaving people behind. That's true. I think they felt concerned that you know they were being prepared for one life, but millions of Americans for another. And I remind them, it doesn't have to be that way, that we should and can prepare everyone for success in the modern economy and reconnect people who fall out of the economic boat. That's what mass participation is. But you know, to get there, we can't be talking about protecting people from things they don't like, or we can't be talking about pensioning people off from life. From enlightenment, enlightenment thinkers on, you know, economists have had the view that being all in the economy, participating, working, having a flourishing life is the goal of the system. So that's a great segue to your book, The Wall and the Bridge. That is not uh, a reference to our immigration policy necessarily, no. <laughs> although perhaps people might be purchasing it uh, because that's what they think of uh, when they hear a, a wall. And, and, and of course, the bridge would be the opposite approach. Uh, here you're talking about using this metaphor in terms of economic policy. Take us through the metaphor and, 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 and kind of why you chose to land there, the wall and the bridge. Let's go back to the student's question about, you know, where prosperity comes from and who shares it. You know, growth is something we all should celebrate if we don't already. But growth doesn't happen in the way textbooks often talk to students about this sort of nice linear progression where we each become incrementally a little bit better off over years, it accumulates over time, we're all blessed. The real fact of growth is that it's very disruptive. It comes in big spurts, it changes economies and industries. Some people are big winners in that process. The economy on average wins in that process, but disruption also creates, at least in the short term, people who get left behind too. So think of it like a coin. The heads is growth, the tails is disruption. You can't own half a coin. You got to own the whole coin. So if we say we're a pro-growth economy, it means we have to deal with the disruption. And here's where walls and bridges come in. The political process says, you don't like disruption? I'll make it go away. We'll build a wall. So historically, that's been walls against new technologies. You know, going back to the Middle Ages, each time a labor-saving technology came out, some aspiring courtier, politician, or monarch said, oh, can't have that. It'll hurt average 
people uh, and the rent seeking, of course, that that goes around uh, that goes around that. There have been also walls uh, in the contemporary economy against trade and globalization. All of those are with an eye towards saying we're going to put it back the way it used to be. But of course, that's inconsistent. Think about that tail side. If I throw away the disruption part, I'm going to throw away the growth part. So what's a bridge? Well, a bridge definitionally takes you across something to a point, or it takes you from a point back to where you started. That's what a bridge is. In a policy context, a bridge would have two sides. It would be first preparing people for that economy. So if the world changes, how do you prepare people for that world, the world that actually is not a dream world of the past? And then second, in addition to preparation, would be reconnection. How do you reconnect people back to work and prosperity if they've fallen out of the boat? You know, we once knew how to do these things. So I talk about in the book, for example, the land grant college movement, the GI Bill. We once knew how to, when an economy was changing a lot, reconnect uh, men and women to that new economy. Our social insurance programs go back to the 1930s for an economy we no longer have. They're, they were designed for a program where people lose a job temporarily and the economy turns back up, they get their job back. That, of course, isn't the disruption real people are actually living through and haven't lived through for decades. So we need to change our mindset uh, to be a little more like a Abraham Lincoln or a Franklin Roosevelt in the way we imagine these programs. And I don't mean Roosevelt at the New Deal. I mean, right. Roosevelt of the GI Bill. GI Bill, which you had, you know, the millions of servicemen coming back from World War II. The economy had changed dramatically. Exactly. And they needed to be trained. And it, it of course, uh, made the greatest generation even greater because they integrated into the economy and led to the growth and prosperity that defined you know, the, the decades to follow. L let me ask you a question, stepping, you know, now that you've explained the metaphor of the book, you have growth, but you also have the flip side of that coin, disruption. There's been tremendous growth in our economy, you know, from the time that you were in the White House through to, let's say, COVID. Um, obviously, it's COVID has disrupted so much, and our economy is still feeling its way out of it. Do our policymakers, and particularly here I'm asking about conservatives and people serving Republican administrations, do they focus too much on the growth aspect, keeping the walls down, reducing those barriers, and not enough on the bridges to help people deal with the disruption? I mean, the great thing about our economy, I'll, I'll ask you to respond after this, you know, we have some of our largest market cap companies, you know, our companies measured by market cap, I should say, these tech companies, you know, 25 years ago, many didn't exist. And if they existed, they were, they were just a tiny sliver of what they are today. That's the growth part. But the disruption that they've yielded, did we f not plan correctly? Did we not focus on it? Or did what we tried to do not succeed? Well, we shouldn't abandon pro-growth policies, but we should try to focus on and notice the likelihood of communities and people left behind. You know, in the financial crisis, to me, the most prescient question was asked not by an economist, by the Queen of England. And Say that one more time. Of, the, we were in 2008 of, and the Queen of England the asked Queen the best of, question? The Queen of England showed up. Uh, at the London School of Economics to a room full of economics worthies. I think it was a building dedication. So I'm picturing her arriving with pearls and a handbag and probably <laughs> not enormous treasure troves of economic questions. But she did ask in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis, why did nobody see it coming? And the room got incredibly quiet because you know the, you could give a very complicated answer, which I'm sure the economists did, as to why uh, they, we, all of us missed it. But there was actually a simple answer to the Queen's question. We didn't notice. We weren't looking. We weren't talking to real people in real markets as to about what was going on. Now, to your question, we aren't noticing enough and haven't noticed enough in the mega shifts of technological change and globalization. Not that we didn't notice the positive sides, of course we did, but that we wouldn't look ahead at and see how many communities and individuals might be left behind, not with an idea toward throwing out the change, 
but with an idea toward preparing and reconnecting those people. Where we've made policy errors in favor of openness, it's not in embracing openness. It's not noticing the Queen's parlance. So let's go from the Queen to the populace that redirected American politics and certainly conservative and Republican politics in 2016. So much of what you're describing, you know, I, I just intuit, but I'd love for you to agree or disagree or ex and expand that because we didn't manage the walls and the bridges appropriately during this period of s significant growth, people like your students, you know, emphasize we're, we're being left behind. They didn't have the ability to respond and adjust to the economy like FDR tried to do a GI bill or, or Lincoln did, as you point out, with the various legislation during the Civil War that they booted the free marketers, the people that brought us quote unquote globalization and said, we want something else. Give me, give me your take if, if that's the way you read the events and if that's almost like a political fallout from uh, the, the, the economic uh, story that you, you are telling with, with the wall and the bridges. Well, you know, I, I think to some sense, uh, economists of a neoliberal persuasion might have had that coming to them, us. Uh, I tell a story in the book of steel tariffs and Bush, President George W. Bush, and I was sent in to persuade against the steel tariffs. And my wife told me that morning, you know, the world has two types of people. Uh, one is economists and the other is real people. And <laughs> you are an economist out of central casting. The president is a real person out of central casting. Be careful. So I went in, not with sermons from Econ 101 that he surely knew just as well as I did, but I went in with charts. I said, you know, here's um, uh, a share of labor going down. And he said, yeah, I'm trying to stop the falling manufacturing share of workers. I said, sir, I, I just showed you agriculture 1900 to 1940. I didn't label the axes. Is, is it your goal to put them back on the farm? And he got quiet. So I thought, oh, I'm making progress here. And then I showed him a map of the country with job losses. And the job losses, you know, he said, well, where, why are there job losses? I'm protecting people. I said, no, sir, you're protecting steel workers. But what about all the upstream and downstream industries? Now you're going to have job losses. Ultimately, the president didn't go my way, and he called me in. And he said, you know, I found everything you said very correct and very persuasive. And I said, well, <laughs> how come? <laughs> and he said, you know, you didn't tell me anything I could do for the people left behind. He said, you remember that Vice President Cheney and I made speeches in places like Wheeling, West Virginia, where we talked about these places. You didn't tell me anything there. And I viewed that I learned more that afternoon when he had that conversation with me from him on economics than he was going to learn from me. And we have to go back and think about that. And I, I think in 2016, the irony, of course, if that's kind of an indictment of neoliberals, and an irony is that Donald Trump has the opportunity in 2016 and through his presidency to build these bridges, to actually do something material for the lives of people left behind. Now, those opportunities aren't taken, but they may well could have been. I, I think going forward for uh, conservatives, whatever political party you call yourself, thinking of the right bridges that build that social support from the mark for the market economy, we know that it's the golden goose, uh, is very important. Yeah. Great story from uh, the Bush administration. Never uh, a fun experience as a policymaker to have the president of the United States that not go your way. Clearly, you, you reflected on it. If you had the opportunity again, it sounds like it was a lesson in econ you know, economics for you, but definitely a lesson in politics. Um, what would you do differently? How would you brief the president differently? What would you have advanced that might have won the day with, with President George W. Bush so he wouldn't have applied those steel tariffs? Well, I think two things. One, later in his, um, in my time in his administration, I did develop for him so-called personal reemployment accounts, which were long-term training support for people left behind. It wouldn't be in a one-size-fits-all government program. They'd be individually tailored. But that wasn't part of our first discussion. Uh, I also think that um, 
community aid, what's called place-based aid by economists that economists used to be very skeptical of, may be very important. Mobility in America, geographical mobility in America is not what many Americans think. It's not the go west young man mentality of, of Horace Greeley. It, it's something much more subtle than that. So I, I think there are material things that could have been recommended that would make a difference. And, and make no mistake about it, the status quo or a neoliberal, no guardrails economy, a la, say, Milton Friedman, those aren't on offer. So if we don't come up with bridges, the default isn't the status quo, the default is walls. And the walls can be walls from the left, they can be from the right, but they're dangerous either way. Let me, let me just pursue that for a second, because what I, what I just heard you say is we need these bridges because people are left behind with these major disruptions. So it's to really benefit from the growth, we need to look at the flip side of the coin you described at the outset of our conversation and, and, and have this you know, smart people really thinking of ways that that growth and, and prosperity can be distributed to the widest and the largest number of people. But for the mark, so-called market fundamentalists, for the, you know, the avid reader of the Wall Street Journal editorial section where they're constantly reminded, let the market be free, don't interfere with the market. Is your advocacy for bridges something that a market fundamentalist should be able to embrace, or is a compromise necessary to ensure that the walls don't go up given the politics of the day? I would say it's the latter. I mean, again, go back to the point I made that social support for the system isn't given. And nothing I'm suggesting is interfering with markets per se. In other words, I think we should be completely open to new ideas, new ways of doing things, new technologies, new markets, global or domestic. At the same time, we need to prepare people to succeed in that world. So the, the only sense in which I think the, quote, market fundamentalists might have a problem is they might say, well, what Glenn is saying actually costs money. And they would be correct. I talk about that in the book quite upfront. But our current world costs money too. Lost output from building walls costs money. Uh, paying people for non-work costs money. And so I think the question for society is how do we want to spend the money we're going to spend to maintain social support for our system? I think we could do it much more productively. So I, I would hope that the Wall Street Journal editorial board might see it the same way. See some wisdom there. Yeah, pull on that thread a little bit more because one of the things I enjoyed and, and perhaps didn't appreciate was your uh, uh, presentation of Lincoln. Think of Lincoln as the great emancipator, the great advocate for the union, of course, and, and freedom. But he also had an approach that very much uh, thought about the bridges. And you, you touched on it at the beginning of our conversation, but expand yeah. a little bit more and, and, and what Lincoln's kind of economic outlook and the role of government should be in it's, advancing the market. It's incredibly important because you know, sometimes I hear that you can't really reimagine policy or do big things right now because there's conflicts, there's uh, big deficits, there's this, there's that. I don't think any president has faced a more existential question for the nation than Lincoln did. And yet, not just the land-grant colleges, but the Homestead Act and the beginning of the Transcontinental Railroad all happen on Lincoln's watch. Now, Lincoln wasn't, um, to my knowledge, heavily influenced by particular economic thinkers, but he did have a view that opportunity was very important. If you go back in reading Lincoln's speeches, back to the Lyceum speeches early in his career, he talks a lot about um, opportunity. Uh, he doesn't talk much about charity. In fact, he's somewhat condescending about that, but he, he does think that every man, uh, and today every man and woman, uh, deserves an opportunity for success uh, in the economy. And my interpretation of Lincoln's actions is that government has a rather muscular role to play, not an in income redistribution, but as a battering ram for opportunity. So the idea behind the, behind the land grant colleges was, uh, as opposed to today's free tuition movement, Lincoln was on the supply side. He wasn't waiting for Harvard to give free tuition. He was saying, let's build some institutions that will both educate more 
people that are being educated at the time, but we'll also focus on new things. So remember the economy was going through a transition from agriculture to manufacturing. A lot of the debate I talk about in the book about land grant colleges was very much centered on that debate. And Lincoln and Senator Morrill, who designed the land grant colleges, you know, had a view that this should be very decentralized. You know, states will do it differently with different economies. And I think that's why it was very successful. So I think Lincoln had this opportunity attitude that presidents today would behoove themselves to have. That's fascinating. So the way you, you distinguish there between you know, the Lincoln-esque battering ram of opportunity role of the government versus a government just providing entitlements, right? Uh, it's very ahead. different. I mean, in some sense, Paul, I don't know that Lincoln was particularly influenced by him per se, but it's reminiscent of, of Adam Smith's discussion of government. You know, people think of Smith as completely laissez-faire, you know, just let the market alone. That's not what Smith said. So Smith actually had roles for government in what today we would call public goods, you know, public works, infrastructure, uh, some, some education. So Smith was very much interested in an economy where everybody got to participate. He felt competition helped that happen, but I think Lincoln was intuiting that, that we need to do something when an economy's in transition. Smith wrote at a time in the Wealth of Nations of 1776, it's just before a transition to industrial capitalism. Lincoln is pursuing his ideas as the economy goes from agrarian to manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. One other thread in your book that I think is fascinating is the place of Youngstown, Ohio, in your personal journey and then your, um, your experience, but also what you're trying to teach and express. Why is a professor uh, and policymaker spending his time between New York and, and D.C. thinking about Youngstown, Ohio? Well, it's interesting. I guess my question would be, why don't more economists or CEOs or politicians do that? So I, I had wanted to take business school students to the heartland with an idea of, of going back to the Queen's question of noticing and listening. And so I wanted to set up meetings with everybody from business leaders to union workers, to social service workers, to Catholic charities, to local politicians and so on. I knew I wanted to go to Ohio. Senator Portman was very kind to both focus me on Youngstown and to help uh, set up the, the meetings. And the first trip was just an enormous success on, on both sides. I think we learned a lot. Um, they learned a lot asking the students and me questions as well. So I think it was a great experience. I subsequently took students to Decatur, Alabama, which had different kinds of disruption than, than Youngstown. But I think if you want to get in the mind of what is happening, you have to go talk to people. And when I was a student, um, my teacher, Marty Feldstein, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, I think I would get to a roadblock and ask him what to do. He said, well, have you tried walking around? By which he meant, why don't you actually go talk to people who've done something or know something, maybe that would help. And of course he was right as he always, always was. But Youngstown stands out as well because you know, the steel mills. I mean, this, this is a, a great example of, of a but town it, that, go ahead. It is and it isn't. So the interesting thing is Youngstown turns out to be viscerally important for this movement because in September of 1977, on a single day, all the big integrated steel mills closed down without warning. Now imagine a town, um, actually a medium-sized city at the time, that suddenly hit by that without warning, no real um, second best alternatives for the tens of thousands of people who no longer have work. Um, Youngstown bleeds for quite a while. So that's a, a kind of visceral, a uh, visceral hit to Youngstown. But the question also arises as to, you know, what, what to do about it. You know, there, there's a book called um, Why the Garden Club Couldn't Save Youngstown. You know, the, the recipe for um, repairing cities and change isn't um, beautification and thinking about the past, it's thinking about the future. And in, in the book, I talk about examples of, for example, the city of Pittsburgh, which was also hit. Uh, by declines from steel, but did working with local universities, local businesses, reimagine itself. And Youngstown is starting to do more of that too, but it is a, 
a big issue. Youngstown, like many parts of the country too, illustrates a human tragedy from lack of work, from problems with uh, drug addiction. And all of these issues point out the power of bringing everybody into an economy to have a healthy economy. So, you know, President Trump, of course, uh, was elected by appealing to people in towns like Youngstown, um, focusing on the American worker and generally making the Republican Party more focused on those left behind, um, either because the jobs that they had went overseas or displaced by technology. There has been, uh, in the policy world, a related type of, of challenge to the conventional kind of Republican advocating for lower taxes and less spending. And you know, that's a formula for economic success and prosperity. Orrin Cass at American Compass uh, does a lot of this. And he takes a view, which I'm, I'm curious to get your reaction to and, and uh, get a sense of to what extent it compliments or you depart from him uh, with respect to bridges and, and walls. And that is, listen, the, the, the government is involved in the economy one way or the other. Um, and the notion that we have a free market and, and we just need to, you know, remove the walls um, and the, the, you know, we, we're not kind of decided about what outcomes we want. We're always pushing outcomes with our economic policy. So we might as well um, just jettison the myth and as conservatives get a lot more involved in economic policy and industrial policy. I'm characterized it a bit, but that's a, it's many, you know, it's kind of the outlines of this debate and, and prominent senators like uh, Marco Rubio or Josh Hawley. I mean, they're, they're, they're adopting uh, uh, this outlook. How do you organize uh, this discussion, which is, you know, you're taking the populism that President Trump introduced, and now it's kind of distributing itself across uh, the world of policymakers and elected officials? Well, let me give you an I guess an intellectual and then a practical answer. The, the intellectual version, I think, of what Warren is saying is that Adam Smith and every economist since got it wrong. And basically, Smith's radical insight was that the wealth of nations is the ability of average people, all of us, to consume. And so the size of the economy, the productivity of that economy, that's the wealth of a nation, not how many ships the sovereign has or what the sovereign's gold pile is and so on. So that was a radical insight from Smith. Uh, Smith is not interested, nor are economists generally, in protecting particular kinds of jobs. Rather, Smith viewed that competition, openness would allocate capital, would allocate people's time, would allocate ideas. Now, it's possible that Oren is right and that every economist since 1776 is wrong, mm -hmm. or dot, 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 it's actually <laughs> possible that Oren is completely wrong. And he is completely wrong. At a practical matter, why does it matter? You know, why are we fighting over what Adam Smith did or didn't say? My students, if I were to ask them the kinds of jobs they want, most of them didn't exist when I was their age. And so the idea that a group in Washington, let's say led by Oren, is going to say which jobs are the good jobs to be protected, I've, you don't have to be Hayek to be deeply skeptical of that notion. Now, I suspect at a practical level, what led people like Oren and some politicians to these ideas is they asked themselves a question. We'd like to have people with mid-skill levels have solidly middle-income levels, what kinds of jobs in the past did that? If you plug that into a computer, the answer would be manufacturing. But of course, going back to look at answers from the past doesn't match a prologue for the future. And that, that of course, is the problem. So what we need to be doing, and, and here's where I do agree with Orrin, some of the specific things about preparing people for the future, like radical thoughts about what education and training really mean, what kind of certification is important or not, that's useful. The big picture debate over whether Adam Smith is right or wrong, it, it may help provocateurs to say things like that. They're in fact wrong. But whether they're right or wrong isn't even the issue. 
The issue is trying to talk politicians off the walls and ledge. And that's the problem with what Orrin is doing. It's, it's not that he's wrong about Adam Smith, though he is. It's, it's that he's giving cover to people who are reaching for the bottle. It's an old fashioned bottle of protectionism. Right. So, so protectionism is a the problem. They're putting up walls and you know, to extend that people like Orrin Cass and American Compass are, are exploring bridges. You might accommodate that space, right? Sure, um, sure. Workforce certification. Let's focus less on these, you know, uh, of course, I'm not talking about Columbia University now, but these useless degrees uh, that don't get them ready for to make any kind of productive contribution to our economy. But but to the extent that it's advocating an industrial policy, uh, somehow uh, uh, tariffs and the like and protectionism, you know, that that's where you think is. Well, off. I think, you know, if I could just rather than industrial policy, there are two very practical things I would hope Warren might agree. One would be in our educational system to recognize a foot soldier that actually counts, which is community colleges. They're woefully underfunded around the country. They are the foot soldiers of both preparing and retraining the men and women that we're talking about. And there could be a role for a well-tailored federal block grant there. I don't think of that as industrial policy, but it is a reshaping of training and education. Another is to build off the intuition of Lincoln's land-grant colleges, which is to have applied research centers around the country. The land-grant colleges succeeded not only in developing the minds of many men and women, they, they provided aid to um, incipient manufacturing, to farmers, to help with better productivity. Applied research centers around the country could do that. So there are tangible steps you can take without being an industrial policy maven and without having the Mandarin view that people like Warren have of they know what a good job or a good firm is, I, I don't think we do know. Let's follow up on, on two points in this discussion, uh, kind of pulling the thread here in terms of the, some of the alternative views that have emerged within uh, not just conservative circles, but surprising in terms of the pushback against uh, the, the, where there was consensus perhaps a decade plus ago. Let's talk about and the, the global nature of our economy. And I'm curious, when you think about Adam Smith, and you've, you've, been, you've been talking about Adam Smith, both you know where he's known for, the wealth of nations, but also perhaps uh, the other side of Adam Smith, maybe less well known for. But when he was writing, was he thinking about you know a, a global economy on the scale that we have today, where you have nations who we are trading with, uh, and China is, is the best and, and most significant example where they are engaging in you know, significant subsidies with mass distortions of the market. And as a result, the loser, and I think I'd be curious to get your view, but I think most people would say, yeah, the U.S. has lost. We've gained, but also lost significant manufacturing capabilities and, and other types of, of things as a result of Chinese policy distorting this global market. So how does Smith, if at all, um, need to be adjusted or was or, or is, is the framework anticipating an actor like a China, which is this huge economy, but also an economy that is not a free market like like, you know, our order uh, was, was built on designed? Well, it's a great question. You know, the, the man who animated Smith toward writing The Wealth of Nations was a man named Thomas Munn who was the um, avatar of mercantilism. I would say a historically important theory, but it's alive today. Um, <laughs> in, in, a lot, in fact, in many Republican politicians as well. And mercantilist economies, you know, keyed themselves on trade surpluses and things like that. China is behaving like the mercantilist economy that Smith uh, railed against. By the way, it's it's not even so much that we will lose, although we, we will, but China will lose massively in the long run from an economy like that. They're already feeling it as manufacturing seeps out of their economy and they lack the innovative edge that uh, the United States has. What I think Smith would say about China is in today's parlance, you need to think much more about um, regional or groups of trading entities. You know, when Mitt Romney ran for president, he had the idea of a set of nations that had shared values that would trade in, uh, I'm putting words in his mouth, but something like a free trade area. 
the WTO, World Trade Organization, envisions that globally, but China never really honored its promises under the WTO. So to my mind, rather than the, you know, picking around the edges with tariffs, I think there's a fundamental question with China, whether it belongs in the World Trade Organization. Just as China could say to us, we, China, have the right to decide what economic system we want, you could say, well, sure, but that doesn't mean you get to play in this global system. So I, I think those are not, uh, those are not inconsistent. Yeah, fascinating. And of course, so what do you do about it once we're so integrated? And, you know, you got these hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, kind of the dependency in both directions, largest or second largest trading partner on, on each side. You know, we're, we're kind of pregnant with this. And, and, and so how do you correct for it? It seems to me that, you know, this language inside the beltway of decoupling somehow making us less reliant and trade less with China uh, sounds nice, but it's, it would, well, it would I think hurt us a lot. It, Part of it, business people are fixing themselves. So the pandemic and the China conflict had taught many business people they needed more resilience in their supply chain. They didn't need government to tell them that. They have realized that they need to bear a higher short-term cost for that longer-term benefit. So I think that is happening. Uh, I think public policy has you know, turned away from more open arms support for China, whether it's in the Democratic Party or the or the Republican Party, uh, China is unlikely to change in the way that many economists, myself included, maybe a generation ago would have thought it would, that market forces, pressures, global integration would automatically make China more like us. I don't mean necessarily politically, I didn't believe that, but economically, that they would yeah. see that benefit, that has proven not to be true. And so I think when something isn't true, you have to walk away from it. Let's take one more kind of real world example where we're seeing a battle over what our policy should be. Advocates saying it's leveling the paying field between China, which subsidizes, and it's not just China, but China being the primary example, semiconductors and, and other countries, Germany, you know, or, or, or Japan does this. And, and then the United States, which obviously the pandemic has revealed, you know, a real need to have manufacturing, you know, these uh, capital intensive fabrication facilities or semiconductors legislation going through the Congress right now, whether or not uh, there should be industrial policy where for economic and national security reasons, we want to make sure that we have a manufacturing capacity in the United States. It's a complicated problem set, but I've outlined the general uh, uh, features of this policy debate. Our favorite Wall Street Journal straw man comes out, you know, railing against this, but you get a lot of national security oriented people and, and, and those who are, you know, see some space for industrial policy uh, when it comes to something like semiconductors, say, hey, we need to do something to incentivize and ensure the playing field's level and we get some manufacturing of this kind of really critical uh, capability inside the United States. So we're not totally reliant on, you know, Taiwan and 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 dependent and hopeful that China won't interfere with with that commerce. Well, of course, that's already happening. Both Intel and Taiwan Semiconductor are building very large new facilities in the United States, mainly because market forces are pushing them in that direction. Uh, I think that the national security argument isn't really build everything in the United States, it's build things in a safe and resilient way so that you're spread out around the world and in parts of the world that do- It's distributed, that, you're, 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 you're mitigating the risk. Yeah. For example, not in semiconductors, but in lower parts of manufacturing, I might imagine Mexico being a more likely winner than parts of the United States from decoupling from China. So it's really just a matter of where you put things in a safer, in a safer way. I would note though, to the politicians that go down this road thinking about all the jobs, there are not going to be that many jobs. So in other words, America has not lost manufacturing power, not at all. We've lost manufacturing jobs. And mainly that's because American manufacturing, global manufacturing is just a heck of a lot more productive than it used to be. That was the people leaving the farm that I showed President Bush. So you know, if we build some of these things back in the United States, don't think that thousands of workers are no, in fact, with them. It's, it's labor. They don't even know they can fill the jobs. Uh, that, no, that in they fact, will have. I, you, you mentioned Youngstown before. You know, when I took the students to Youngstown, they saw right away a point I'd hoped they would see quickly, which is 
if you walked onto a steel plant's factory floor, you barely saw a human being. You saw many robots. Right. And many of the human beings that you saw were more likely to have a graduate degree than being the burly steel worker that's in a right. politician's mind's eye. Let, let me ask you one more question on this subject with uh, Dr. Glenn Hubbard, the author of The Wall and the Bridge. Really uh, helped me understand the line between what would be a wall and what would be a bridge. I, I almost imagine that some things that you might view as a wall, another might view as a bridge. Um, so l let me get with an example. For years, decades, the, the policy of the United States, Republican and Democratic administration has been, you know, the American story and American success story is home ownership. Government wants to ensure that we create great opportunities for every American to own their own home, not to rent. And so we have tools in place that incentivize capital to go to people like me and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of others so they can own their home, Fannie and Freddie, generally something that was thought of positively until the financial crisis because it was mismanaged or, you know, they made the wrong bets. It was perhaps people were trying to get more than the one home they were entitled to. Is that a bridge or is that an example of a wall? Well, I think good home ownership policy could well be an example of a bridge. Uh, but I would do it very differently. The, the home ownership policies we've had in the U.S. have used heavily subsidized lending. You mentioned the government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, but also the home mortgage interest deduction. The, by far, the largest beneficiaries of these policies are actually the well-to-do, uh, not people just starting up. If we're serious about building bridges in home ownership, we would be doing credits instead of deductions, and they would be for low and moderate income households only. So these subsidies can be a bridge, but not really the way we're currently trying to do it. What, but ha what, hasn't it resulted in, in capital flowing to people who would otherwise not get the opportunity to ha have a loan to buy a home? Yes, but often in ways that haven't necessarily made them better off. And a lot of that capital has also uh, gone to people who would have gotten it anyway except with a public subsidy, which doesn't seem like a good use of the taxpayer's money. That, actually, I think the Wall Street Journal would agree with me on that one. So uh, I'm I, on, their, on their good side with that one. No, no doubt with that. Uh, let's talk about one more area you wrote on recently, and then we'll hit the lightning round. Uh, great conversation with uh, Dr. Glenn Hubbard, uh, former dean or dean emeritus of uh, Columbia Business School. You wrote an op-ed in March in the Wall Street Journal, came up again, uh, titled, NATO Needs More Guns and Less Butter. And this is in reaction to, of course, Russia's war on Ukraine, Putin's aggression, and this vulnerable point we face in European security. Of course, Chancellor Schultz, the Chancellor of Germany, came out soon after. And really, uh, for, for uh, the Social Democratic Party in Germany, a huge shift in terms of saying we are now going to invest in our, our defense. What got you thinking about more guns and less butter when it came uh, to NATO? And, and uh, do you also think the United States should be included in more guns and less butter? I do. And I think what got me into this was both rhetoric and math. I was very concerned when President Biden said to the American people, you shouldn't have to suffer from any of this, and at the same time, pushing a Build Back Better agenda or dental benefits for the elderly. I'm not a military expert, but people who are remind me that the current level of defense spending, which is a little over 3% of GDP, if it's around 3.2%, it's substantially lower than it was during the Cold War. So I'm not comparing it, say, to World War II or Korean War levels of spending, but during much of the Cold War, it was almost twice that. Right. And so even if we had to increase defense spending by one percentage point of GDP, that's an enormous fiscal swing. And we're not going to be able to borrow that money year in and year out. We're already on a fiscally unsustainable path. So in this country, we are going to have to make a choice if we want that military spending. And I expect most Americans at this point might raise their hand for that. We would either have to raise taxes by that amount, which has growth effects that aren't positive, 
or we'd have to right size other kinds of spending. Whereas no politician wants to have this debate. Neither one of those subjects of cutting spending or raising taxes is very popular. In Europe, the problem's even bigger. You know, Europe was already under its promises under NATO, not all economies, but most of them. And so Europe also had higher debt levels typically than in the United States. So this is going to be a significant fiscal shock for Europe to look at social programs too. So both the rhetoric and the math led me to do it. And I, I'm still not hearing a lot of politicians, the politicians are talking about the defense buildup, but not a lot about how the heck we're gonna pay for it. Of course, Washington has been spending like crazy end of the Trump administration, beginning of the Biden administration in terms of COVID spending. We just reduce that, I mean, that, I kind of you address this in your piece. Kind of, how do we think about COVID spending versus defense spending? Um, surely, you know that was off budget, you know, emergency spending in the trillions. Here we're talking about, you know, roughly one percent GDP more wouldn't be a trillion dollars in a single year. No, it would be a little over two hundred billion dollars a year, but it would be um, long term maybe even, quote, forever in prison value math. So that's a much bigger number than we're talking about during during COVID. I personally think we overspent uh, during COVID. I think that's one of the reasons we have inflation problems that we have today. Right. But I do think we need to have this discussion. But I get concerned that in, at least among President Biden and the Congress, much of the discussion just seems to be how much more social spending we can do how is that reality when we have the need for a military build? Well, perhaps in, in another session, we could talk about America's comfort with debt and whether or not there'll ever be a comeuppance for it, because it seems like the outlook of policymakers and elected officials is, um, you know, as long as we can f finance the debt, it doesn't matter how much debt we accrue and, and never really have to pay it out in total. But we'll, perhaps we'll save that for another day, Dr. Uh, Glenn Hubbard, uh, let's let's close out this discussion, fascinating discussion uh, on your new book, The Wall and the Bridge, and kind of the economic policy uh, that our country has pursued over the uh, past uh, decade or so. Here we talk about our, our f favorite Reagan book, speech, or quote as part of our lightning round. Give us your favorites. Well, I'll say three things. Uh, I have always been an enormous admirer of the late President Reagan. I, the, the book Ronald Reagan in his own hand, which contained his speeches going back to his General Electric days, were to me a real window into a person who would one day become uh, a leader. I, for anybody who hasn't read that book, I think that's the essential Reagan uh, reader. The two quotes of Ronald Reagan struck me as particularly apropos of the discussion we've just been having. The first was kind of a, a populist, although I think the Reagan literally in that term, deflation of an elitist. And it's the classic turning to Carter with, there you go again. <laughs> that powerful line is sort of an everyman saying to the elites, you're just spinning wheels and talking, but you're not relating to real problems. I expect that's why Ronald Reagan became president and why um, Populist critiques still can have a lot of value. The second, which I talk about in the book, is um, the famous Mr. Gorbachev, tear this wall down. And the irony, as I mentioned, it was tearing walls down that got us into this. You know, it was the fall of the death of distance, the death of communism, all of these things that opened up, sort of made openness, you know, spread very fast and caused the disruption. But Ronald Reagan was at the very nub of it on both sides, both in the tearing down walls, but also in deflating elitists like Carter. Dr. Glenn Hubbard, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to having you back. My pleasure, thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend.